Amen. Amen. Bless you, Amen. My soul waits. Yes, sir. My soul waits. My soul waits. Before we go all the way up in there, let me. In 2007, Apple, the manufacturer of some of those electronic devices that we all have, the manufacturer of this tablet that I have here. They began tracking the amount of time that people stood in line mm. to purchase their electronic devices. Uh -huh. This commenced back in 2007. When the original iPhone was released in the United States, there was a gentleman by the name of Greg Packer, a maintenance worker from New Jersey. He was the first to line up outside of New York's Fifth Avenue Apple store to buy the very first iPhone. He waited a total of 110 hours. That's nearly four and a half days if you do the math. But wait a minute though, a year later, someone topped that record. Waiting in line for 168 hours. <clears throat> That's seven days waiting in line for the iPhone 3G this time. But then in 2011, a record was set that stands to this very day when a gentleman by the name of Rob Shoesmith waited in line for 240 hours outside of an Apple store in London for the iPhone 4. 240 hours. You don't need an MBA like Minister Young. You don't need to be on finance like Sister Z to know 240 hours. That's 10 long days in line for an iPhone. It's been said we live in a microwave society. Yes, sure the people are impatient and unwilling to wait for anything that we need instant fulfillment, instant gratification. Yeah. But as evidenced by those examples of those gentlemen waiting for an iPhone, we know that that's not entirely true. Right. People are willing to wait. People are willing to wait. We will wait for those things that bring some type of reward, some type of gratification, some type of fulfillment for these gentlemen. It was those electronic devices that they waited for. Yeah, yeah. But we'll wait also, won't we? Yes, yeah, yeah. We'll wait for some things as well. We'll wait for a job. Yeah. We'll wait for a promotion. Come on, say amen, somebody. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it. We'll wait for that car. Yeah. We will wait for that house. Yeah. We will wait for that acceptance letter and daddy's approval to go to Kyle Baptist University. We will wait <laughs> for that ideal man, that woman. We will wait. We will wait. Yeah, we will wait for these things. And we will wait and pray that God make a way for us to get those things. And ain't nothing wrong with it. But here in Psalm 130, the psalmist is not speaking of electronic devices. He is not speaking of material possessions. He is not speaking of those things of temporal value. He's not speaking of those things that are fleeting those things that are perishable. He's not speaking of those things that may defect, yeah. those things that may decay, yeah. or even those things that may die. He's not speaking of those things. The psalmist is not speaking of those things, gratification and satisfaction that comes from those gifts and possessions. And there's Nothing wrong with us to desire and to pursue and to have those things. But we know that those things, the satisfaction yeah. that comes from them, are just artificial. Yeah. Yeah. And it's temporary. Yeah. In fact, it's a substitute mm -hmm. 
It's a short-lived fix. For our hearts, our souls, true longings, true learnings, yeah. and true desires. Yeah. The psalmist is speaking of those things that have eternal, mm -hmm. yeah. everlasting, yeah. unending value. Yeah. Pastor Jefferson has made it clear that he wants a bit. Yeah. 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 Do I have it right? That he wants a Bentley. Yeah. But I am 100% sure yeah, that he knows that that vehicle yeah. will not satisfy and fulfill an internal longing and desire. I'm confident about this. I know this about him. He knows that it will not fulfill the desires of the soul. In fact, you think you have problems, get a Bentley, and once you start paying the note, yes, <laughs> you have more problems after the fact than you had before. Okay, that's another story. The true yearnings and desires, the fulfillment of the soul, that's something that only God can address. That's something that only God can address. Just a couple of weeks ago, my wife was talking to me, or she asked my opinion about Bruce Jenner. Bruce Jenner, the Olympic gold medalist, Bruce Jenner. Yeah. But he was on the cover of a magazine, and he says, call me Caitlin. Bruce Jenner. She has heated discussions with some of her co-workers about the matter, and there were a range of emotions and feelings and sentiments concerning Bruce Jenner that were feelings from acceptance all the way to celebration. Acceptance and celebration all the way to repudiation and condemnation. Do you understand the extreme yes. of the debates? Well, my wife asked me, Mike, how do you feel about it? And I had to let her know that I feel compassion. I feel compassion and love for the brother. Because he's spoken candidly about a lifelong internal struggle, a, war, a warring, a wrestling inside with his identity that has almost taken him to the brink of suicide. I feel compassion for him. I feel compassion. Because he's been deceived into believing that like countless others, that by changing his external features, yeah. that he will be able to address some type of internal deficit and yeah. long. Right. Right. He's been deceived. Yeah. Can I say that again? Oh, yeah. Into thinking that by changing the external features, he will be able to address some type of internal longing and desire. Feel compassion for him. Because after a while, after the hormone therapy, after a while, after the physical transformation, after a while, after the operations are complete, after a while, he will soon be met with a great disappointment. That gender reassignment can't fix a troubled soul. Mm, I, feel, I feel compassion for the brother. I feel him. His problems will still persist. Earlier this week, the Supreme Court ruled five to four in favor of making gay marriages, same-sex marriages, constitutional. And now all states must change their definition of marriage and allow gays to enter into the sacred union. Again, a range of emotions, sentiments, and opinions. Some people, appreciation, jubilation, celebration. And on the other hand, condemnation, repudiation. But across the nation, 
record number of people are scheduled to get married this summer. The expectation is that merit, the ability to choose a same-sex partner will bring some type of satisfaction and fulfillment. Mm. But after a while, after a while, when the ceremony is over, after a while, when the wedding bells cease to ring, after a while, after the honeymoon is over, after a while, when they go back to their day-to-day -day lives, after a while, many will discover that merely having the ability or the right to choose a same-sex partner is not sufficient to remedy the longings of the soul. But lest I be considered homophobic or tr transphobic, let me bring it right home to us, right. to church folk, yes. Christian folk. Mm -hmm. We think also that access to social and political institutions, yes. we think that access to prestigious colleges and universities, right. we think that influence and political power. We think that positions and jobs and titles, we think that cars and homes and material possessions and luxurious vacations, we think that finding that special someone, that special man, that special woman, we think that these things can satisfy the longings of the soul. But after a while, in our quiet time, after a while, in the sanctuary of our hearts and our minds, after a while, the painful truth is no one, no person, no thing is capable of satisfying the desires of a soul created to enjoy our God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's the sermon in the sentence. That's the thesis of the entire message. Yes, sir. Some of us seek fulfillment in self-indulgence and excess. Mm -hmm. You fill in the blank, whatever that may be. Yes. But it's only momentary satisfaction and in fulfillment, and it quickly dissipates, leaving us empty, yes, yes. longing, yes. searching, yes. high yes. and low yes. for another fix, yes. for another thrill. For that another high, yeah. searching to be filled again. How is it that some people can have all of this world's good yeah. and still be miserable? Yeah. How is it that they can still be empty, yeah. having everything imaginable, yeah. materialistically under the heavens? Yeah. And yet they're still dead, yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. depressed, yeah. destitute, yeah. and despairing. Yeah. The world's promises of joy outside of our Lord is a lie. Yeah. It is an illusion. Genesis 2 and 7 said, the Lord God formed man yeah. out of the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life. Yeah. And man became a living soul. Yeah. It was the breath of God. Yeah. The pneuma of God. Yeah. That is the very substance and the essence of who God is, who God is and yeah. what our lives is. Yeah. It is the breath of God that became the source of our life and energy yeah. from, the beginning. from the beginning. So it only makes sense, mm -hmm. Sister Tracy, yeah, yeah. that the breath of God mm -hmm. will continually yeah. 
be our source of strength and energy to this day. That it will be essential to our survival. The Apostle Paul said, it is in him that I live. It is in him that I move. And I have my very being. When our bodies need energy, what do we do? What do we need to do? We need to eat. We need to satisfy our bodies with a variety of foods, some better, some worse. Our body then digests these foods and converts them into energy so that we can keep going. No food, no energy. No energy, and you ain't going nowhere. I had Friday off, and I took my girls to the park. Put them through some exercises. We were jumping rope, doing some jumping jacks. We were running, we were playing, and about 30, 40 minutes into it, I began to get lightheaded. <laughs> I began to get woozy. And I had to catch myself. Let's I toppled over and, and fell right there, which would have been devastating. They would have been scared out of their minds if daddy passes out out there on them. And I had to wonder, what is going on? I didn't feel like it, but I discovered that I was hungry. I needed something to eat. How many of you could be so busy and so active and like, you forget to eat? I was operating almost 1 o'clock in the afternoon off of a cup of coffee. I took a bottle of water with me out there, but I, just, I said, I need to eat. I said, that's enough. Let's wrap it up. Let's get up out of here. And so we headed up Angeles Vista and went down the street up there to Simply Wholesome. I got them some chicken patties and a shake. I got myself a turkey burger and I inhaled that thing. I mean, just, I just inhaled it. It was gone. I didn't realize how hungry I was and my need for energy and nutrition and sustenance. This physical phenomenon mirrors a spiritual reality. Our souls, our inner being, the seats of our passions and desires, the inner man also needs food and nourishment. And the food that the soul requires is the Word of God. Yeah. That's right, that's right, that's right. Amen. Amen. I'll clap to that. I'll clap. The food that the soul requires is the Word of God. It is the Word of God that provides the energy that our soul needs to keep going. That provides the energy that our soul needs to escape despair. The energy that our soul needs to maintain its strength. Yeah. The energy that our soul needs to give us that joy. Yeah. The energy that our soul needs that will keep us going on and pushing forward. Yeah. Our soul's food yeah. is the word of God. Yeah. Our soul's food yeah. is the word of God. Yeah. The word of God will stick to your ribs your spiritual ribs and give you the substance needed to carry on. Jesus quoting Deuteron Deuteronomy 8 and 3 when he was on a mountain. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus knew this reality. Jesus knew this to be true. Jesus knew it as necessary. So much more should me and you. Job said, I have not gone back from your commandments. I have esteemed the word of God more than my necessary food. Job knew that the word of God was that source that provided that energy and substance for him to carry on through his difficult times. When his soul was in its most perilous condition and state, Job nourished himself, giving himself the ability to move forward, nourishing himself on the word of God. It's fine to have people and things on our side. I have wonderful consolation. Know that my wife is there, that my children are there. That I have a mother that's there. That I have a brother who I can call on. That I have a pastor 
who I can call on that I got deacon wine yes. that I can call and say, brother, pray for me that I have a church family yes. to count on. I, I have this, you know, this, this assurance. I have this. But I've got to wait on God. Oh, yes. I've got to wait on God. Yeah. Oh, and I'm learning. Learn. I've learned Learn. to wait on Him. To roll out of bed in the morning and straight to my knees yeah. and wait on yeah. Sometimes not even saying anything, but just kneeling down there and just waiting on him. Wait waiting for a touch. Yeah. Waiting for some strength. Mm -hmm. I learned to turn the TV off and put the electronic devices to the side. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. And wait on yeah. Yeah. And to wait on yeah. Just to listen and to wait. I've learned that when I'm driving in my car to and fro, turn the radio off and just wait on it. Just wait on it. Just to wait on the Lord. I've learned to step away from the office and that workspace and just take a walk or go sit in my car and just wait on God. Just to listen and wait on God. I learned to study the word and absorb the word and to speak the word and to believe in the word and hope in the word and take a verse or two a day and just chew on the word of God. Right. Meditate on it all day long and just wait on it. That's what these verses did for me earlier this week. I just repeated five and six day after day, just repeated it, just repeated it and it sustained me. And it kept me, along with Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the wings of the Almighty. I will say unto the Lord, Lord, you are my refuge. I trust in you, God. Hey, glory! It will give you that supernatural strength and joy and peace to keep you and to bring you through. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. The psalmist says, I wait on the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word do I hope. Verse 8, he said, my soul waits for the Lord. Watch this. He said, more than those who watch for the morning. And it was so nice he had to say it twice. He said, more than those who watch for the morning. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what you're going through, but I'm telling you, morning gonna come. Yes, Lord. Morning's gonna come. Yes. Day and night, morning and evening, God has promises it will not cease to yes. even morning will come. Yes. And just how the psalmist say he watches, he waits, he hopes in the Lord, like a watchman who watched for the morning, he knows that the morning is gonna come. Yes. So we know that God is gonna come. Right. He'll be here. Yes. He will show up. Yes. He will be your very present help yes. in the time of trouble. Yes. Wait on him. Wait. Wait on him. And nourish your soul on his word. Yes. On his promises. Yes. He said, the words that proceed out of my mouth will not return unto me void. Yes. But it's going to accomplish that which it was sent and the purpose that it was sent. It will achieve that. God will not fail. God will not fail. He's a strong deliverer. He is a mighty redeemer. He is our salvation and help. He will redeem. He will restore. He will renew. Hallelujah. I'm a living witness and testimony yes. to this truth. Yes. Wait on the Lord, church. Yes. Wait on the Lord, beloved. Yes. Wait on the Lord, brothers and sisters. Yes. Wait on the Lord, pastor. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Yes. He will come through. Yes, he, will. he will come through. Yes, he will. God bless you. Yes. God bless you.